Amen. So we have called this little mini-series Revision, and over the last couple of weeks, Rick has been speaking about the vision of this church to see Shadwell and East London transformed by Jesus. Uh, In week one, Rick looked at uh, Genesis chapter 26 as Isaac redigs the wells that his father Abraham had dug but had been either filled in by enemies or had just dried up over a period of time. And he spoke about our call as a church to be a church that plants churches, that redigs those wells where churches perhaps have dried up, things have got a little bit tired, uh, maybe uh, you know, the people have moved on. And we're going to redig those wells, renew those churches to see them come to new life once again. We're here to redig wells. Last week, he looked at restoring the city and looked at Jeremiah chapter 29, where the people of God are driven into exile into a strange land. They're in Babylon, in the city of Babylon, as exiles there. And Rick was saying, just as we are exiles in this great city of London... Still the people then were called to transform their community, to make a difference, to bless the city. And that's our calling as a church too. This week we are looking at Nehemiah chapter 4 and the call of God on us as a church to rebuild our walls. Here the people of God have returned from exile back to their city, Jerusalem. The church, God's vehicle for making disciples. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. But my question for you to kick things off is a simple one. Why do you go to church? Why do you belong to a church? Why would you say, I am the church? For me, on a good day, it's because I believe the church is the last best hope for humanity. It's the body of Christ. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where we see the kingdom of God at work. On a bad day, I think, sit there and think, I'm working for a geriatric, decrepit, prejudiced institution in terminal decline. Those days don't come that often. But what about you? Maybe you're here because as a Londoner, you're aware that it's easy to feel alone and isolated, so you value the social life here, the the community, your friends. Maybe you are wondering uh, what your life holds, and you're at a bit of a crossroads, so you're looking for some advice, some moral direction. Maybe you're aware that the rest of life just feels a little bit stale, so you're looking for uh, some experience. Maybe you are just blown away by Matt Tinsley, our new worship leader, and you just love the music. Maybe you think, wow, this is such a funny church. They wear wigs and do things like that. It's incredibly entertaining. Or maybe for you it's just something that you have always done. It's a habit you have, a tradition you follow. You have this sense of obligation. It's something you ought to do. And you look around you and you know that people expect you to be part of a church. But deep down, you're not quite sure why. Well, Nehemiah gives us a slightly different perspective. He says it is so important to be rebuilding our walls together. In fact, it is a matter of life and death. It is a cosmic struggle for our survival, for your survival, for my survival. So what does Nehemiah call us to as a church today? Four things, I think. Firstly, he calls us to close the gaps, then rally the troops, fight for your lives, and lastly, keep your clothes on. And we'll look at those in order. Verses 6 to 9, he calls us to close the gaps in the wall. You see, we have a job to do. Nehemiah understood that in his gut. You see, the church is not about you and me. It's not about our needs. It's not about, actually, the friendships we enjoy, the experience of God that we have, the guidance we're looking for, important though all those things are. The job we have to do is to rebuild the walls. 
Here in Nehemiah, the people of God are returning from exile and they come back to a city in ruins, a city that has been destroyed, that has been broken down. And after 141 years, this generation is called to rebuild the walls. And that's our calling in this generation, as it is the calling of every generation. To rebuild, to mend, to bind up. Healing the wounds of the living stones of the church of Jesus Christ. Of those of us who are broken and wounded, who are defiant and bound by sin. It is a call to see lives changed as God works in us and through us by his Holy Spirit to make us more like him, to make us holy. That is something we are all in together. It is obviously a work in progress. The wall here is only half its height, and it's exactly the same today, isn't it? I don't think any of us would sit there and say, well, the church is all it could be. It clearly has not yet what it one day will be. It is a work in progress. It is something that is ongoing, and it is our responsibility altogether as exiles waiting for the heavenly city. This, says Nehemiah, is what we were made for. We have a job to do. And so he says we're to do it with all our hearts. Second half of verse 6. It is something to be something we are passionate about, focused on. It is to be our priority. How does it make you feel when I say to you, church matters more than anything else in your life? Probably you sit there and think, does it? Just instinctively, I want to suggest to you that really it does. It's more important than your work. It's more important than your family, your friends, your leisure time. So you need to give it your best. You need to give it everything that you have. The church isn't a hobby or a pastime, and neither for Christians is it an optional extra. The church isn't a kind of spiritual mother's union or a pressure group. The church isn't just another faith-based organization. Jesus gave his life for what? For the church. He laid down his life for the church. What will you give? What will you lay down for the church? Nehemiah says to us this morning, we have a job to do and it's We are to do it with all our hearts. But when we do, we are to anticipate opposition. And it's something he spends quite a lot of time on, doesn't he, in this passage, verses 7 to 12. And you feel the sense that it is overwhelming. It comes from all directions. They plotted together to come and fight against the Jews. And they bear, the people of God bear their taunts and their contempt. And they come from everywhere, all directions. You get Sambalat and the Samaritans from the north. You get the Persian Arabs from the south. You get the Ammonites from the east and the Ashdodites from the west. They are, of course, the uh, descendants of the Philistines, Israel's greatest, most fearsome enemies. So they are surrounded by enemies. But that's not their only problem. They also have a problem from within. Look at verse 10. There is this lament from the people themselves. The strength of the laborers is running out. There's too much rubble. We can't do it. Their their initial enthusiasm for what seemed to be a good idea at the time is now suddenly waning as they see the size, the scale of the task that faces them. And they are growing uncertain. They get this sense that the ruins of many years are just too much for them to deal with. The task is too great. The expectations are overwhelming and unrealistic. And they are thinking to themselves, what were we thinking when we agreed to this crazy idea of Nehemiah's? So they are surrounded by enemies. They're themselves, they're beginning to doubt what's going on. And then, on top of that, verse 12 says, their friends are also putting the boot in. Verse 12, the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. 10 times over. That is not helpful, is it? These are the naysayers, the ones who say, it can't be done. We've tried that already. It doesn't work. Don't bother. Give up now. Don't waste your energy. 
So the people of God, they are isolated. They're, they're cut off. And the reality is we too today live in an increasingly hostile culture where there is a, a, a kind of consistent pressure to back down, to step away, and to compromise. And it's easiest, easy for us to lose heart. But Nehemiah says to us, look, you've got a job to do. You've got to work at it with everything you have, with all your heart. And of course, you've got to expect opposition. But we are to close the gaps in the wall. How are we going to do that? Well, the first thing we have to do is to rally the troops. What is the first thing that Nehemiah does? Verse 9, when he sees the threat, he prays. That is the first thing in the face of all that opposition. He prays. He trusts God. His power his love, his victory. He recognizes that it is not something that he can do by himself. The vision that God has given him is huge. The vision for this church is huge, isn't it? We cannot do it by ourselves, in our own strength, under our own steam. We've got to pray. And we have to take responsibility for that ourselves to be ready for anything that God throws at us because we are dependent on him. That's why in 2014 we're going to be focusing a little bit more on prayer. That's why uh, Rick and Louis, as they've come back, have instituted a, a new prayer meeting on Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. Let's get praying together as a church because that is the first thing that Nehemiah does as he rallies the troops. The second thing he does, though, in verse 13, is he organizes the people. Do you see how he prays and he posts a guard and he posts them in their families? And so you don't have a, a kind of either or. It's not prayer or action. You don't say, I'm a prayer. I'm somebody, I'm an intercessor or I'm a contemplative or I'm a worshiper. Oh, but I'm an activist, so I don't do those things. Or the prayer says, well, I'm a contemplative, so I, I'm not an activist. No, the two go together. It's a both and. So when we pray, we have to respond. We have to do something. And so Nehemiah organizes his people, mobilizes them, recognizes that each of them has a part to play. So what you see here in this passage is not just a big gathering of individuals. There are units within the larger gathering, households, clans, that are bound together by bonds of kinship, bonds of affection. There are close relationships here. He talks about sons and daughters, wives, homes, and you know, we do the same thing here in this church. We are gathered here today as all the people, but we have, we organize one another into units, which we call connect groups. And that's because all of us believe that gathering on a Sunday is a really good thing to do, but it is not enough. Connect group is the place where you can belong. Connect group is your family. A connect group, in case you're wondering, if you're new here, great to see you, you're very welcome. Um, a connect group is a mid-sized group that meets in the middle of the week between 20 and 35 people, something like that, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. Uh, it meets fortnightly. Uh, it is the best place to meet people, to make friends. We enjoy a meal together when we do that. Uh, it is a great place to try out some of the gifts that God, you feel God wants you to step into. So if you want to dabble in a bit of worship leading, try it in a connect group. If you want to see if you can um, kind of teach, try it in a connect group. If you want to lead others in prayer, try it in a connect group. It's also the best place to invite your friends to who don't yet know Jesus and you want them to see what a gospel community looks like. You know, you can invite your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues. It doesn't matter. A connect group party is, is a great environment to do that in. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're not in a connect group, join a connect group and make that a priority for you. Now, just in case you are thinking, mm, it's all right for you to say it, you're a leader in the church, I just want to invite Charlie uh, to uh, come and share a little bit with me. You might need to grab a microphone, which there is one there. Look, perfect. 
Give him a round of applause, Charlie. Um, tell us what you do. For a job. Well, you can tell us what you do for, for a job. <laughs> uh, no, I lead the Kingdom Connect group here at St. Paul's. And what is it about the Kingdom Connect group that you love? Uh, pick up on the word you used in family, um, because I think uh, uh, when Katie and I lead uh, this group, we feel that actually we're leading a family, that we um, are so blessed with so many amazing people that choose to be a part of our group, and together we're all family to each other, um, and whether we are rejoicing in the highs of life, or supporting each other in the challenging bits of life, or we're supporting each other in the, the, the ministries and tasks that God set before us. We're all doing it together as one, as family, and that's why we, we love it. And there was a great example of that this morning. Philippa, who is a member of the Kingdom Connect group, was preaching at our 9.30, and I was just talking to her before the service, and Steve, who was uh, playing bass today, comes off the stage and just walks up to her, interrupts our conversation, gives her a massive hug, and says, it's great to see you, how are you doing? I'm excited about your talk this morning. And I thought, well, that is Connect Group Love in Action. Um, so if you want to experience something of that, talk to Charlie afterwards. Hands up if you're in the Kingdom Connect group. There we go. They're all supporting down here, some at the back as well. So go and talk to one of them afterwards. Don't miss the opportunity. Charlie, thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. So Nehemiah, as he rallies the troops, says, pray and organize the people. He also says, empower the leaders Verse 14, you see how he charges his nobles and his officials to fight for him. And it's something that's done in public. So you see there, there's this reference to the low point in the wall where they haven't really built much of the wall up yet. Um, And so he stands there where the enemy can see him and says to the enemy, look at us. We are well-armed, well-organized, and well led. Just look at these leaders that we've got. And one of the things that we want to do this morning is just show you your leaders and commission them at the beginning of this new term. And we want to do that with our connect group leaders and our small group leaders. And we're just going to take a moment to do that. So if you are a connect group leader, can you stand up please? Fantastic. If you're a small group leader, can you stand up, please? Okay, if you would all like to come to the front, just stand here in the front in me, just here, that would be amazing. And I'm just going to invite Rick and Louie, if they'd like to come up, and just pray for you guys. Give them a round of applause. So these are various uh, connect groups, small groups within those connect groups. We'll talk about those in a little while. Um, but we're going to just pray for you. Thank you, guys. I do just stretch out a hand Mm. um, to pray for them as well. Father, thank you for um, each one of these Connect Group Leaders and Small Group Leaders here today. Thank you that they represent um, many more in the life of the church. And we, first of all, want to say, Lord, please would you uh, bless them. Please would you uh, give them everything they need in their lives, as, um, not just as leaders, but as people, mm. um, in their families, with their friends, with their um, workplace uh, um, and their community life. Lord, please bless them. And we pray, Lord, for their leadership, Lord, that you would increase the gift of leadership upon them. We pray that you would enable them to lead with, uh, with um, great wisdom, with great love, and with authority. And we pray that just as they help others to follow Jesus, Lord, that you would help them to follow you as well. And we ask, Lord, for your um, anointing to rest on each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Let's give them a big clap, shall we? Mm. (laughs) 
So Nehemiah, as he rallies the troops, prays, he organizes the people, and he empowers his leaders. The last thing he does is he communicates clearly. Do you notice in the second half of verse 14, his instructions are really clear, aren't they? He says, don't be afraid, remember the Lord, fight for your families. Do you notice there he appeals to their hearts? Don't be afraid. He recognizes the emotional cost of what they are doing. But then he appeals to their heads. He says, remember the Lord. Know who he is, what he can do, what he has done for you. Think it through. And then he says, fight for your families. He gives them something to do with their hands. So he appeals to their hearts, their heads, and their hands. And that's something that we are have been trying to do with this particular vision series. We want to touch your heart so you are excited about what God is calling us to as a church together. And we want to explain our thinking on how we think God is going to help us to do that, enable us to do that. And lastly, we want to give you an opportunity to get involved because if you don't, nothing's going to happen. Simple as that. And so in rallying the troops Nehemiah says we've got to pray, we've got to organize, we've got to empower our leaders, and we've got to communicate clearly. So we've got the task to close the gaps. We're going to start doing that by rallying the troops. The next thing we've got to do is fight for our lives, verses 16 to 21. He begins that idea by saying you've got to use the tools that you've been given. Verses 16 and 17, do the work Build the wall. It's building on the thing I was just saying. You've got to play your part. Each of us has to play our parts. We are more than consumers, more than spectators. We are called by God to exercise the gifts that he has given us, to invest in ourselves as we grow as disciples, but to invest in others as we make disciples. We are to be disciple makers. So use the tools that he has given you. But then he says, wear your sword, verse 17. You see, following Jesus isn't a lifestyle choice, is it? We all know that. Jesus isn't an accessory or a supplement. Church isn't a leisure pursuit or something we do on the weekend. What Nehemiah reminds us of is that we are not, any of us, in neutral territory. We're in a hostile environment. We are in a fight, a fight for our lives. We are at war and we are surrounded by enemies in a cosmic conflict, a battle for your soul and for my soul. And our enemies are sin, sinners and Satan. And they are out to get you and me. And so you need to have your weapon ready. Do you notice how some of them wore their swords on their belts whilst they worked. Some of them carried their swords and their trowels and they worked with one hand with a sword at the ready. Others, whoop, swords in both hands. Nice. They were protecting the guys that were working on the wall. Now, any of those pictures might make you think, yeah, that's where I am. But each of them has a weapon at the ready. And the reality, says Nehemiah, is that we are all under threat because we are spread thinly along the wall. And so you need to defend yourself and you need to defend one another. Charlie, can I just ask you to pop back up here again, would you mind? That would be really good. So this is the picture. Just, um, just stand there like that. That's amazing. I'm going to stand you like this. Get your swords out. Okay, imagine us surrounded by orcs. This is Lord of the Rings. Okay, and we are fighting the orcs on either side. Okay, and we are protecting each other's backs. If I do this, he's in trouble. So I've got to stay here, and he has to stay there. That is the call. Thank you very much, Charlie. You're doing well today. Um, the picture that is painted here is hand-to-hand -hand combat in the trenches, on the ground. It is... You know, guerrilla warfare, it's hard going. But that is the environment that we are in as followers of Jesus. So what are your weapons? When Charlie and I were up there, what, what do you think? What's my weapon? What do you use? What's your thing? I think... 
God gives us two primary weapons. He gives us scripture on the one hand and prayer on the other. The promises of God to speak over ourselves as we defend ourselves and to speak over others as we defend one another. And the power of God as we pray to break spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you know how to use your weapons? We've got some scripture Saturdays coming up over the next few months. Uh, Come along on a Saturday morning. We're going to dive into a particular book of the Bible. We're going to spend some time trying to understand how the Bible hangs together as a whole. It allows you to wield your sword with precision and expertise. Uh, Early in the new year, we're going to be uh, running a prayer ministry course. Learn to pray for one another that we may defeat the enemy that seeks to overwhelm us. So use your tools, wear your sword. Thirdly, he says, listen for the trumpet. Verse 20, be ready, be alert, be focused. He's saying pay attention wherever you are, whenever it is. He's saying, look guys, you need to understand this is not a game. We know that really, don't we? It's serious business. And he says this thing that I find really interesting. Um, Verse 20, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there, our God will fight for us. And do you know what went through my heart at that point when I read that? I want to see God fight for me. I want to see God fight for us. And to do that, I've got to be there. I've got to respond to the trumpet blast, to the call. And so of all of you, if we're going to do it together. So we need to be ready as we listen for the trumpet. So use your tools, he says, wear your sword, listen for the trumpet. That is how you fight for your lives. And lastly, he says in verses 22 and 23, keep your clothes on. You're thinking, what is he going to say now? What he means here is we need to go deeper. Don't take your clothes off. There's no downtime in the Christian life. We're not supposed to hide parts of our life away uh, that others in the church can't see. We need to get to know each other. We need to be transparent in every area of our lives. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be real. We need to go deeper. And of course, that takes time. So here, he's talking about 24-7. They're not going on breaks, are they? So we are not talking about Sundays. We're not even talking about a meeting in the week. We're talking about day and night, living life together. So we need to go deeper, and that takes time. And so I want to encourage you, if you are in a connect group, but you're not yet part of a small group, join a small group. A, small group, a connect group is made up of small groups. And the small group is really the place to grow. No more than eight people. And re- it's, it, we're developing it as the kind of vehicle, if you like, f- where we are hoping we will be making disciple makers. It's the place where you can be discipled by a pastor. It's the place where you can share life with just a few people. It's the place where you can examine your hearts together and see change take place. Next week, we're going to begin a new series called All You Need Is Love. And that's where we're going to be launching a resource for our small groups called Making Disciple Makers. And we really hope that can be of use to you as you seek to to grow as a disciple of Jesus, but also to be a disciple maker yourself. So if you're going to go deeper, it takes time to do that. That best takes place in a small group. So Nehemiah is saying to us, close the gaps. You do that by rallying the troops, fighting for your lives, and keeping your clothes on. So what have we looked at in this series as a whole? We've thought about what it means to re-dig the wells. That God is calling us to build a movement of church planting churches. This is the vision that God has for this church. We've thought about the call of God to restore the city. 
Joining God in the renewal of all things, transforming our communities, our neighborhoods, and our society. This is the vision God has given this church. And he is calling us to rebuild the walls, to grow this church, to make disciple makers of each one of us, to see a groundswell of connect groups and small groups led by apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers and prophets where lives are changed, where we grow into maturity as followers of Jesus. This is the vision that God has given us as a church. And the simple question I've got for you this morning is the question that Rick has asked you the last couple of weeks too. Are you in? Are you in? There's a postcard just in front of you or just behind you if you're on the front row. It's lovely to have people on the front row. It's very un-Anglican. It's because there's a good Presbyterian, that's why. (laughs) Um, Pick it up and have a look at it. It says, I'm in. Now, you may already have said yes to this and filled one of these in. That doesn't matter. You can do it again. On the back, it says, I'm signing up to the vision. It's putting your money where your mouth is, in a sense. Putting your name down, your contact details if we don't have them. And right at the bottom there, underneath St. Paul Shadwell, it says what that means when you are saying, I'm in. And we're asking you, if you think, yes, I'm in, what does that mean? It means you need to belong. So if you say, I'm in, that means you are either in or going to join a connect group. And the good news is, is that all the connect groups are meeting together this week on the 1st of October or the 2nd of October, Monday, or Tuesday or Wednesday. So now is the week to try out a connect group for the first time. It also says... That if you are in, you are committing yourself to grow. And so get stuck into a small group. That's the place to grow as a disciple and a disciple maker. And it also says that you are committing to give. And these last three weeks, each one has been a gift day. And we are working hard to ensure that we can resource everything that God is calling us to. And it is a huge vision, isn't it? And there are times for me when I think, we can't do it, can we? But time and time again, I have seen God provide. So if you're here this morning and you think, yeah, I need to give to this vision because I'm in. Give a one-off gift today. If you are somebody who uh, is not yet giving regularly, And we have 107 regular givers in the whole church, and we'd love to see more than that. Then there are some stewardship forms at the back. Fill in one of those. Start to give every month. And remember what it is you are giving to. It's not salaries. It's not buildings. It's not equipment. It's the vision that God has called us to as the people of God in this place. And it is only then we will see the work multiply as we pull together and do what God has called us to do.